Gene Simmons, Peter Chris, Paul Stanley, Ace Frehley, Kiss, Rock and Roll Over. When it came time to go back into the studio to make our next album, we had to decide whether to work with Bob Ezrin again. Ace and Peter were pressing us to get back to basics, to being a four-piece rock and roll band without arrangements, ballads, or someone else telling us how to play. Bob Ezrin had enhanced and broadened our sound. He had magnified the four characters. But when we asked people around us what they thought of it, they sometimes said things like, it's different. Different is not a good word in that context. It's a word people use when they can't make up their minds whether they like something or not. The truth is, the change scared us too. Maybe we didn't want to have a nanny this time around either, someone telling us how to do everything and blowing a whistle in our faces. We figured we'd done our apprenticeship, and Peter and A certainly had no desire to work with Bob again. We decided to try a more meat and potatoes approach, go back to basics. The first thing we did was contact Jack Douglas, who had produced Aerosmith's three most recent albums, Get Your Wings, Toys in the Attic, and Rocks. The problem was that Jack was friends with Bob, and he turned around and told Bob we had asked him. It wasn't tactful on Bill's part not to tell Bob first, the whole thing blew up and we felt like we'd been caught hitting on a friend's girlfriend. Then came the idea of going back to Eddie Kramer because Alive had been so good. We rented the Star Theater in Nanuet, New York, outside the city, but close enough that we could all go home at night. Eddie came on board and we retreated to familiar territory as fast as we could. Even though Eddie was from South Africa, he had the air of an English gentleman. He was part of the heritage we all loved. One thing we hoped Eddie could fix was our drum sound. After all, he'd been part of getting that big drum sound Zeppelin had. He had Peter set up in the theater itself while we played in a studio elsewhere in the building. We linked Peter in by video camera. In theory, even a chimpanzee beating on pots and pans could sound thunderous in the right environment. But still, the drum sounded tinny. Soon, however, I came to the conclusion that in Zeppelin's case, John Bonham was that sound and Peter Chris would never be John Bonham. At the time, a certain segment of our fan base felt that Destroyer was a very plush record. If you listen to it today, it's one of our most consistent rock records, and it probably stands the test of time as well as any. But they were violins, so for some people, that was a problem. Change is always difficult for the hard and heavy. Eddie didn't function as a musical director or visionary in terms of arrangements the way Bob had, and we missed that leadership. No one was there to help us write or shape songs. I was having trouble coming up with songs, so I asked Sean Delaney to come over to my apartment for writing sessions. Those informal get-togethers at my 52nd Street place yielded Makin' Love, Mr. Speed, and Take Me for Rock and Roll Over. So Ace and Peter wanted to get back to doing straight-ahead rock and roll, and we were sensitive to that. We rented out the Star Theater, a theater in upstate New York that Frank Sinatra actually had a stake in. Later on, it went out of business mysteriously after a fire. There was a center stage and seats all around it. We brought in Eddie Kramer 
and started work on the next album, Rock and Roll Over. We recorded the songs that Paul and I had written on tour. Ace and Peter also submitted songs, most of which were, at least in our estimation, not up to par. The ones that survived wound up being on the record, but rearranged and rewritten. Go, baby driver, be driving on down the road. The situation within the band had deteriorated even in the space of six months since we made Destroyer. Peter brought in a cassette with a disjointed sketch of a song called Baby Driver. He always brought tapes with recordings he'd done with co-writers because he couldn't play us a song any other way since he didn't play any instruments. Peter lashed out when we worked on his songs. But the problem wasn't that Gene and I rewrote his songs. The problem was that the things Peter brought in weren't songs to begin with. The lyrics never rhymed. There weren't any delineations between verse and chorus. They were scraps, not songs. Yes, the band was stronger when everyone participated, but somebody had to lay down the law when something simply wasn't good enough. Bob performed that role on Destroyer, created Beth for Peter, and guided us all creatively. Now that it fell to us, it was futile to try to hold Peter to the same standard we insisted on for the rest of the material. There was leeway because, hey, we wanted a Peter song. That was part of the image of Kiss, and now because of Beth, Peter expected to write the songs he sang instead of singing Mine, Jeans, or Aces. But even with the additional wiggle room as far as quality, we couldn't let his stuff undermine the integrity of a record. Of course, for Peter's co-writer, getting a song credit on a Kiss album was a gravy train, so Peter always pushed his buddy's ideas and made a stink if anyone suggested they weren't quite up to scrub. Peter spent all his emotional energy worrying about his place in the hierarchy without the ability to be honest with himself about the quality of what he brought to the table. There were plenty of things that Paul and I did without taking credit for, because we knew that the fans preferred to think that everybody in the band wrote and was as creative as everybody else. It was a relatively stable time for the band. We were fairly happy. Still, talking about stability and kiss is like talking about freedom in a prison. It's all relative. Ace and Peter continued to do the most bizarre things. Ace had a fascination with Nazi memorabilia, and in his drunken stupors, he and his best friend would make videotapes of themselves dressed up as Nazis. At the time, the mayor of New York was Ed Koch, who was Jewish, and Ace showed me a piece of tape where he and his best friend were making verbal threats against the Jew in New York, saying, we'll cook him up. Of course, he was drunk out of his mind. Paul and I weren't thrilled about that, but Ace laughed at how funny he was when he saw the tape. Peter, too, was drinking heavily and using drugs. At one point, he went into a club and allegedly demanded that a certain substance be put in front of him in a bowl. The owner of the club refused, so Peter tried to intimidate him. But nothing happened. Again, he was all bark and no bite. 
This was how he liked to do business, with intimidation and bluster. <laughs> Despite all this hassle, Paul and I stayed loyal to the band. No matter what the lunacy was, the band was together. In retrospect, it might have been a mistake. We would have saved ourselves a ton of headaches if, at the first sign of trouble, we had made changes in the band. Throughout this time, Ace and Peter were begging us to do exactly that. Later, when Ace made his solo album, he went on record and said that if he hadn't left the band, he would have killed himself, because he said he wasn't allowed creative freedom within KISS. But once he left the band, he went bankrupt, filed Chapter 11, and became a bigger drug addict than he ever had been, I'm sorry to say. Ace, God bless him, has told me he believes in extraterrestrials, ghosts, karma, and other bizarre things. He has a lucky number, which is 27. If he gets changed from a cashier and he's got two pennies and a quarter, he'll stare at them until you ask him what he's doing, and then he'll say, look, if you add up these coins, they become 27. Or if you're in a restaurant and the prices of the specials are on the board, he'll add up those numbers to figure out what to order. If a number there interferes with his lucky number theory, he'll just discount it. At one point I told him, Ace, I think you better pick another lucky number. You haven't been so lucky. But he doesn't understand. He's the kind of guy who will come back from Las Vegas and tell you about how much money he's won without saying a word about how much he's lost. Ace was a shadow of his former self. He had been a bright light that looked as if it could explode. He had the talent to be as good as he thought he was. The potential was there for him to have been one of the all-time greats, but the booze and Valium and Coke and whatever else now left him incapacitated almost all the time. We prayed we'd be able to get a solo out of him before he passed out. He wasn't funny anymore, in any way. When he tried to tell jokes, he had to stop and slur, How's it go again? The situation sometimes made me angry. I had busted my ass for the band, and I felt that these two guys were playing fast and loose with my future based on their irrational whims and inner conflicts. And yet, because the deterioration took place in stages, I found I accepted things I never would have initially. If you try to bend a tree down to the ground, it breaks. If you bend it incrementally, little by little, you can get it parallel to the ground without snapping it. It just took time. That was me. Fame creates monsters. And I'm not just talking about Ace and Peter. I'm also talking about myself. At around this time in 1977, we hired a new road manager, Frankie Skinlaro. He was on the shorter side and round, and we loved him. He missed his calling in life because he constantly kept all of us laughing. Frankie had been through the rock wars with other bands. He had heard all the drug and booze stories, and he was wise to Ace and Peter. He was also wise to Gene and Paul. He gave all of us nicknames. Once he got to know us, these names reached right down to the core of who we were and what each of our personal agendas was. One of Peter's nicknames, for example, was Peter Long, because he was always complaining. He was also called the Ayatollah Chris Cola and Mr. Misery. Ace was high octane because he was frequently tanked. Paul was the he-she because of his androgynous appeal. 
I was Jean the Nazarene, Frankie thought, rightfully so, that I had an inflated sense of myself and that I thought everyone else was an idiot. He would often say, oh, thank you so much for talking to me. I feel so honored. I want to grow up to be exactly like you. He kept bowing to me and scraping. It was humiliating, but I deserved it. Come on! Hard Luck Woman was an anomaly because I never intended it for Kiss. I didn't see songwriting as an exercise, and normally I was good at self-editing. If I didn't think a song had a place on a Kiss album, I didn't bother to finish it. But I was still fascinated by trying to figure out what made certain songs by other people tick. I've been listening to Rod Stewart's Maggie May and You Wear It Well with that in mind and decided to try my hand at something similar. If never I met you I never have seen you cry If not for a first hello We never have to say goodbye The lyrical spark came from someplace completely different, a song called Brandy by Looking Glass that was about a sailor's daughter who worked at a bar. Once I finished the song, I couldn't imagine Kiss doing it. I planned to try to get it to Rod to see whether he wanted to record it. But with Beth doing so well that fall, Eddie Kramer and Gene both thought the song wouldn't make a logical follow-up for Kiss. And since Peter had that type of raspy voice like Rod's, we figured he should sing it. I had to record a vocal for Peter to follow, and again, he took many takes to provide enough material to cobble together a finished version. Sometimes I wondered how far would be too far. Were there things we shouldn't do? But at that point, the answer was no. It all seemed good, phenomenal even. Kiss radios, kiss motorcycles, kiss lunchboxes. As the money started to flow from Bill's merchandising concept, as well as continued sales of Alive, I have to say I was impressed. It was exhilarating to hear about money going into our personal accounts. We still drew a fairly modest weekly salary and didn't take physical possession of the rest of the money, but we were told about it. Again, we didn't know much about what was going on. We didn't understand the various revenue streams, where they came from or where they went. None of it. Bill soon moved his office to an entire floor of a building at 645 Madison Avenue and ultimately rented another floor in the same building. Bill's marketing of the band's imagery expanded our appeal beyond a rock audience. One afternoon back in New York, I went into a jean shop on 59th Street. The register sat atop a glass display case, and on the case was a sticker Bill had distributed to promote Destroyer that featured the fantastical graphic novel-style album cover image of the four of us painted by Ken Kelly. As I was poking around the shop, a mom and her little boy walked up to the counter, the boy, who couldn't have been older than four, pointed to the image. Kiss, he said. Cool. We are more than a band. A band makes music. A phenomenon impacts society. And if a kid who had no idea about music recognized Kiss, weren't we a phenomenon? In the mid-70s, we were popular enough that teenagers and even younger kids were buying our records. And that meant lots of other Kiss products were in demand. Halloween masks, lunch boxes, stickers for school notebooks, pencil erasers. Moving forward with the merchandising changed the complexion of the band. It changed the size of the vision, the shape of our projects, everything. And it wasn't greeted with universal support from the band. Ace and Peter didn't like it. 
because they didn't see the big picture, and even Paul was a little reluctant. Some things he saw as improper in a rock and roll context. Paul often would, and still does, shoot down ideas because he's more cautious. He tries to contain what we've got. Though I'm supposed to pick up the phone at all times and discuss new ideas with him, I often don't. I just plow straight ahead and do it. Whether it's kiss my ass toilet paper or history books, or whatever, and later on, Paul and I have words with each other. They're never fatal disputes, though. They're spirited disagreements. I would sit up and do drawings. In fact, I came in with an idea called Kiss World in 1976 that I had our lawyer's trademark. I wanted ten flatbed trucks with everything inside them, designed so that when they pulled up to the state fair, the walls of the trucks would open up and flatten out so that all the trucks connected to each other. There would be stairs, and in the middle, a big tent. And all of a sudden, you would have a facility. You wouldn't have to rent out a venue. Instead, you would go to an open field where you would sponsor KISS wet t-shirt contests, run concert film, host KISS tribute bands, and most important, sell KISS merchandise. I had it all designed, but the band decided not to do it. It was too big, they said, and too commercial. To this day, I stand by it. Your eyes had a welcome sign. Your lips said you'd be mine. You came, and I knew it all the time. And your name. We had a few weeks off in L.A. before we went to New York to start recording yet another album. One night I ended up going out with Lita Ford, who was then the guitar player in The Runaways. Lita and I had some fun times together. She was only 19, but her band had just released their second album and were about to head off for their own tour of Japan. The two of us went to a club called The Starwood for a show. The opening band, The Boys, featured George Lynch, who went on to fame in the band Dokken. The boys played a cover of Detroit Rock City. The second band was called Van Halen. I was impressed. They had another show the next night, and I made Gene go with me to see them. Near the end of Van Halen's set that second night, Gene got up and disappeared. Little did I know he'd gone backstage and spoken to them about taking them into a studio to record a demo. He never told me. He didn't mention it when he returned to his seat. I found out only later. It was funny because I always thought of Gene as the one member of the band I could count on, and yet he still did secretive things like that. It was that old impulse of his, and he never felt the need to explain any of what I saw as sneaky or dishonest behavior. Every once in a while, I would see a band that I knew was going to be big. Van Halen was one of them. I saw them in a club, the Starwood, in 1977. I went with B.B. Buell a model who was friendly with a number of rock stars. She's perhaps better known today as the mother of the actress Liv Tyler. B.B. and I were going to see a band called The Boys, and opening was a new band called Van Halen. Within two songs, I knew they were going to be huge. Strangely, they did only okay at the club. People liked them, but it wasn't a maniacal response. But I knew. I went backstage, went over to them, and introduced myself. I went right into business mode. I wanted to know their plans. They had a potential backer who was a yogurt manufacturer. I said, please do me a favor, don't do that. I'll fly you to New York. I'll produce your demo. I signed them to a contract. Immediately, I started to bring them around. In Los Angeles, we went into village recorders, and in New York City, I bought David Lee Roth some leather pants and belts and platform shoes. Then I produced their demo at Electric Lady Studios, 13 to 15 songs, most of which wound up on the first and second albums. Some of those were my arrangements. 
The next step was to try to convince Bill O'Coin and the rest of KISS to sign them. During our stay in New York, Gene came up to Bill's office and played us finished demos by a band called Daddy Longlegs. It turned out that was a name he came up with to replace their original one, Van Halen. Bill and I listened intently and later spoke, without Gene, and agreed to pass on getting involved with him, not because they weren't great, not because they didn't have enormous potential. We passed to protect KISS, which needed our daily focus to continue building on all fronts. Gene's wandering eye was clearly a potential risk to all we had accomplished and all we were working toward. But the rest of the guys in the band were angry that I was turning my attention to other acts, and Bill O'Coin thought Roth looked too much like Black Oak, Arkansas. He didn't get it. I told Eddie Van Halen and the others that even though they were signed to me, I would try again after KISS toured. Within two or three months, Van Halen got interest from Warner Brothers. I said, you go for it. I'll tear up the contract. Just go.